Where did this story begin? 13 years ago, I set up my company, Sales Doctors, and, and I've, I've had the pleasure now to work with just over 26,000 professionals. And when I set my business up, I made a decision. In order to develop salespeople and professionals, I needed to understand what do the best do differently. And I made a decision to focus on the top 1%. I, I looked at some of the best salespeople I've worked around the world, and I, I identified, I broke down, I codified what the top 1% do different. So what I'm going to share with you today is what the top 260 sales professionals around the entire world do differently. And that was how Inside the Mind of a Serial Seller was born. And... What I also noticed is the top professionals weren't just salespeople because they were people who had passion, belief, knowledge, love, care for what they did. They weren't necessarily salespeople. And I'll explain what I mean by that. One of my biggest clients is in Devon, actually, called Webbers. They're a very big estate agent, about 28 offices. And whenever we start training, we always go around the room and we get all the delegates to introduce themselves by name and by role. And, and I was working with this group of about 30 salespeople. And they stood up, they said their name and their role. And I got to this lady in the middle called Sarah. And she stood up, she goes, my name's Sarah, and I'm just a receptionist. She sat back down. This guy then stood up and he said, my name's Mark. And I said, Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sarah, what's your role? And she said, I just told you, I'm, I'm just a receptionist. So I said, let me just understand that. If a vendor, a seller, phones up your agency and wants to put his or her property on the market, is it possible you would take that phone call? She said, yeah, absolutely. That, that's what I do. So I said to her, you're not just a receptionist. I said, when that phone call goes down, the entire perception of Webber's rests 100% on your shoulders. The feeling that that individual got, the emotions you created, the story, the brand, is on you. I said to her, you're not just a receptionist. I said, you're the CEO of the first impression. And she looked at her boss. I said, I'd like a pay rise, please. <laughs> but the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is you are the CEO of that first impression. When you're on your airline, it might be the first time they've flown with you, and the feelings they get is what you give them. In the room today, we have the best of the best. And what I'm going to share in the time I have available with you is what the other best do differently. So let's begin. Buyers have changed. Buyers have absolutely changed. On the left is a picture of how people used to buy property. They used to go into a traditional high street agent and have a viewing and buy a house. Did you know now over 36% of the population buy online? They, purple bricks we are aware of. And this is just the start. This isn't going away. But there's now an online auction for property. You might not know this, but they've created eBay sites for property. Who would have ever thought you can actually bid online for a house? That's dangerous when you're drunk. <laughs> but this is what's happening. Buys have changed. People used to like snacks, like crisps. You don't see that these days. I was at one of the biggest banks, UBS, recently. There was about 150 guys in a row, traders. Every single one of them had a protein shake on their desk. You know, it was mad. Every one of them. So their snacks were protein shakes. Why? The world's changed. People buy differently. Show of hands, how many here use Uber? Show of hands. People buy differently. Yes, we still get taxes, but we order them online now. They're disruptors in the market. And for us to understand our customers, for us to understand our shoppers, for us to understand our guests, we've got to know how they think. We've got to know how they want to be served by us. Interesting statistics. Look how it's changed. There's been an increase now in flight only. Why? Because 
People want to, want to do their own research. People use the likes of Airbnb to find their dream place to stay. They don't rely on buying the package anymore. The market is changing. And for us to understand how to serve our guests and serve our customers, it's understanding the mind of the buyer. How do they operate? And the habits have changed. As Jimmy referenced, the vegans, buyers are changing, their habits are changing. Let me demonstrate this point. That was a real customer. <laughs> Guys, show of hands, who here just goes in and says, can I have a coffee, please? Show of hands. They don't serve coffee anymore. <laughs> they don't, they serve iced coffee. But they, if you go in to Starbucks and say, I'd just like a coffee, they look at you like you're mental. <laughs> this is the customers now. They have changed dramatically. They've got more demanding. There's so many options available to them. So for us, we need to understand the mind of the buyer. What do they want different? The times have gone of this. In order to serve, in order to, to give the customers what they want, we need to understand how they think. We need to understand how they operate. It's our job to know, to have the knowledge of the way they think, work, and operate. I'm going to show you a video where, to me, this is about what I call intelligent selling. I created this methodology called Killer Sales. And Killer is my sales methodology that's now worked with over 26,000 people. And in the time I have available, I'm just going to show, share some of the key components of what I mean by Killer. Show of hands, who believes this to be correct? Show of hands, who believes in this? Show of, show of hands, who's heard of this before? All heard of it, yeah? Show of hands, who believes it to be correct? Were you told differently? Oh, good, so you were learning. Okay, I didn't know, was it Alison? Fine, okay. So I don't know what she said, I hope it's the same as this. Spot on. Why is that, guys? Because we're different. We are all different. We can't... I'm very different to my wife, bless her, because therefore you can't treat me the same as her. One of us will get upset and frustrated. And it's about understanding how they operate and think. And this derives from something called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's about advanced communication. And just to explain it very briefly, if you see the world through John Smith's eyes, you are more likely to get John Smith to buy from you. I want to demonstrate this point. With your right hand, make the shape of a gun, please, with your right hand, everybody. You've done that before, haven't you? <laughs> Turn that into a circle. Perfect. Just place that on your chin. Is that your chin? <laughs> so why does that happen? Why does that happen? It's Simon Says. The technique, guys, I just used on you is called instantaneous rapport. It's a matching technique that's very powerful because the way the brain is wired, we subconsciously match what we see. So in order to serve our customers how they want to be served, we need to match things. 
We need to, if, if you're dealing with them over the phone, we need to match their tone of voice, their volume, their pace, the words they use. Don't match their accent. That's called racist. That doesn't wash. But you match what you see. And in order to get that, it's about how they see the world. Let me, let me explain this. One of my clients you may have heard of is called Ren Kitchens. Show of hands, who's heard of Ren Kitchens? The, yeah, the big retailer. And they're one now the largest re kitchen retailers in the world, or in the UK, sorry. And about four years ago, I was doing some training with them in Manchester. And there was about 20 sales reps in the room. And I said to them, you know when a customer walks into your branch? And the manager, Caroline, put her hand up. And she said, they're not our customers. I said, yeah, fair comment. So I said, you know when a prospect walks into your branch? She said, they're not our prospects. I said, what the bloody hell are they? She said, they're our guests. She said, Tony, anyone who walks into my store is a guest. And I treat them like that. I said, I really like that, but what does that actually look like? And what she did, and it's something that Jimmy mentioned, I really like it. At Ren, she created the 10 commitments. These are, these are not rules that can be broken. These are commitments that you adhere to. And one of her commitments, number one, is everyone is a guest. So I said, I really like the concept, but what does it actually look like in real life? She said, well, let me ask you, Tony, how do you treat a guest? I said, I'd be welcoming. She says, that's what we do. So when a guest walks in, they're welcoming. Morning, welcome to Wren. And what they used to do is they go up to the guest and go, morning, I'm Tony, can I get you a drink? Quite interestingly, 80% of the guests politely refused the drink. What do we do, ladies and gentlemen, if we ask a question and we get the wrong outcome? Change the question. Always blame yourself. And I, I notice this with salespeople. Often they ask the wrong questions and they get the wrong outcomes. I'll give you a good example. I work with a lot of estate agents and they'll say things like to their buyer, have you been looking long? And the buyer says, yeah. And then they say, have you seen anything you like? No, which is why I'm talking to you. It's the wrong question. The right one, what's the best you've seen so far? It's called a killer question because it gets the best outcome. So when I did some coaching with Ren, I said, the reason they're saying no is you're, you're asking them a closed question. Change the question. What did they change it to? Hi, welcome to Ren. Would you like a tea or do you prefer a coffee? 80% chose a coffee. Why is that? Psychologically, 80% of people always choose the second option. I don't know why, but it's fact, it's proven. And, and, and I do this socially. If my friends come around for a takeaway and I love a good curry, I always say to my friends, guys, should we get a Chinese or do you fancy a curry? We always get a curry. It's amazing. It, it doesn't always work. I often say to my wife, should we go out to the cinema or just stay and have sex? <laughs> I've seen so many films, you've got no idea how many films. I literally live on popcorn. If you don't get the right outcome, you change the question. But, it, but it's about understanding your buyer, your guest, your shopper, however you see them. And it's about knowing how they want to be dealt with. So one of my biggest clients that I've worked with for 13 years, and all of you, I, I reckon, have used their product. They're called JX Technology. Do you know when you go into a doctor's surgery, and nowadays they have those electronic displays where you enter your date of birth, and it populates your details? Yeah, you know what I mean? And they're the market leader. They've got about 260 salespeople. And I remember six years ago, I won them. And I went into their company, and I met the MD, a guy called Agam Jane. And I walked in, and I sat down, and my first thought looking at Agam was, this guy's weird. Do you ever get that? You meet someone, and you think, a bit odd. That's what I was thinking. And, and Agam said to me, what are you here to sell me? And I said, well, Agam, I'm not. I just want to know about your business, understand your team's challenges, and see if I can help. And, and I wanted to break the ice. So I said, Agam, you know, tell me a bit about you. And he said, what do you want to know? I said, well, I can see you're married. You know, how long have you been married? He went, four years. I thought, I'm not going to push that. <laughs> he said to me, what technology companies have you worked with? Now, luckily, I had a case study. 
So I started explaining the case study. He went, yeah, great. What were their KPIs? And I remember thinking, I've been here one minute, and we're talking KPIs. He hates me. That's all I was thinking. I explained the KPIs, and he said, what were their conversion rates? And I answered the question. Cut a long story short, I was in and out of that meeting in 15 minutes. And my meetings are normally about an hour or more. When I sat in the car to review the meeting, I thought, why didn't we connect? What, what did I miss? Anyway, two days later, I did my proposal. Two days later, I phoned to get feedback, as I promised. He ignored my call. Two days later, I phoned again, ignored my call. I then emailed, I called, he ignored everything for two and a half weeks. So now I just wanted to learn, I wanted feedback. A couple of days later, he sent me an email. Tony, I'd like to go ahead. He said, I'm going away on a conference. When I get back, I want to set objectives again. It dawned on me, he was a blue. He was a pupper smurf. And I know we know the behaviours, I'm not going to talk about them, but I understood I'm dealing with someone very different to me. I've known Agam for six years. I've seen the guy 60 times. All I know about Agam, he's been married about 10 years. That is all I know about him. And he doesn't know a single thing about me because he doesn't care. And I get that. So do I have a connection, a rapport? Yes, just not the one I like. My job is to serve him how he wants to be, not how I want to be. A couple of months ago, I emailed Agam. I said, Agam, there's a technology for marketing show at London Olympia. You should go. His response, already going. I remember thinking, how bloody rude. Like, why can't I say, let's meet for a coffee? Kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> but it's not his world. And I get that, and I don't take offence. So when you're on your flight and you see different guests Buyers, shoppers, know they're different, understand how they think, how they operate. And this is what the top 1% do different. On the right there is Andrew. Andrew, in my experience, is the best salesperson I've ever met. And he does intelligent selling to a T. So last summer, I went away to Italy. And I remember it was sort of the last minute shopping before you go away. And I went into this, my local Waterstones in, in Watford. And I went up to this guy, Andrew, and I said, Hi there, have you got a book called Here and Gone? He said, I don't know, let me have a look. He said, I've never heard of it. So he started having a look, and he said, what type of book is it? I said, it's a thriller. He said, oh. He said, I love thrillers, I've never heard of it. So he's looking it up, and he said, is thrillers your normal genre of choice? I said, yeah, I love them. He said, me too. He said, do you like criminal thrillers? I said, my favourite. I've read all the Martina Cole books. And then he looked it up. He goes, you're in luck. We've got one in stock. Come with me, he said. So he took me to the back of the store. And as we're walking to the back, he said, I take it you've read The Dry. I said, no, I've never heard of it. He said, you've never heard of it. He said, it's my best thriller I've ever read. He said, it's been our top selling thriller for the last three consecutive months. Then he took me to the shelf. He got out here and gone. He said, you're in luck. If you buy this one with the dry, it's buy one, get one half price. Do you want it? I said, I'd like that. And then he took me to the till. And as I was paying, I was holding a coffee in one hand and I had something else in the other. He said, your hands are full. I take it you'd like a bag. I said, yes, please. And he gave me a bag. As I walked out of that shop, I stood there and I went, I've just been done. <laughs> he got me. Let's just break down what he did. He showed an interest. I've never heard of here and gone, what is it? It's a thriller. Then he asked me, is that your genre of choice? So he's showing interest in me. And I said, yes. Yeah. So we built some rapport because he asked me, do I like criminal thrillers? He explained that he did. He then gave a very clever, assumptive question. I take it you've read The Dry. That engaged me because I hadn't. I then, when I said I haven't, he said, oh, it's my personal favourite. Everyone likes a personal recommendation. So if I'm umming and ahhing at this point, he then got me. It's been our bestseller for the last three consecutive months. A third party proof. People are always persuaded by other people. And if I was still wavering, do I want to buy it? Do I not? Buy one, get one, half price. He did me. And then he got 10p for the bag as well. Killed me. 
but he was the best salesperson I've ever worked with. Why? Because he didn't sell to me. He helped me buy. We don't sell, guys. That's not our job. Our job is to help people buy from us. And I want to share this to another level. I, that wasn't me videoing her bottom, by the way. So apologies. <laughs> If you can't hear the volume, I'll explain in a minute. Did anyone hear that at all? Okay, let me explain what happened. Apologies. It, this was last week on a flight back from France. And I wanted to test what the air hostess, how she sold it to me. And what I said, so that someone videoed it for me, so that's why you saw her bottom. That wasn't me, I promise. And, and what I asked you is I said, I've currently got some dry skin. And I want to know, would this skin cream work for me? And she said... No, you don't want that one. And then she told me a product, which you didn't hear, a name that I wrote down. And I said, do you sell that? She said, no, no, you can get it at the local Boots. And that was it. Now, part of me thinks her knowledge was okay because she knew a product, but that wasn't intelligent selling. What she should have said is, you say you've got dry skin, tell me more about that. What specifically are you experiencing? <laughs> no, you know what I mean. The, Maybe I've worded it wrong, but you get my drift. <laughs> then she'd have said, that product is absolutely perfect for you. Let me explain why. Intelligent selling is about asking the right questions and then recommending the right product that you sell. Don't take them elsewhere. So bless her, she recommended a product, but she didn't sell the one in her brochure. She sent me to her competition. That's not intelligent selling. I don't know if you recognise this, I was very fortunate last summer, my wife took me away to the Forte village uh, in Sardinia. And I don't know if anyone's stayed there before, but it's absolutely breathtaking. And it was for my 40th, it was a, a surprise for me, and my wife took me with our two gorgeous children. And it's, I, I was so excited, she told me on the plane, this is where we're going, you know, and I've wanted to go there, it's been on my bucket list for years. And we got into the reception, and as we, as we went through these grand doors, there was beautiful marble floors, huge ornate mirrors everywhere. It was absolutely stunning hotel. And we walked into the reception, and as soon as we got there, they said, welcome the Morris family, they said to us. I thought, how the bloody hell did they know that? And I noticed the guy at the front had a mic piece, so he obviously mic'd it through. And my little girl Poppy had lost her tooth on the plane. So she was holding a little tissue to her mouth. And the lady at reception said, oh, are you okay there? What happened? And Poppy said, I lost my tooth. And she said, oh, bless you. She goes, well, look, your tissue looks a bit messy. Have a pack of tissues. And she gave us the tissues. They checked us in. They got us some drinks. And then they took us. Someone came, a chauffeur, to take us to our, our villa. Because you didn't stay at a room there. You've got your own sort of little private villas. It was beautiful. And we went to our villa. They helped us with our luggage, and they helped us unpack. And then we sat there, my kids were playing on their iPads, and me and my wife were just relaxing, chilling in the room. About 15 minutes later, we got a knock at the door. I thought, it's obviously, someone's forgotten something. I went to the door, and it was a lady dressed as a tooth fairy. And she said, I'm here to collect Poppy's tooth. Where is she? Poppy burst out crying, as you can imagine. She had this little bag, like a jewellery bag, and she took Poppy's tooth and she gave her a one euro coin in exchange. My son, who's 11, who doesn't believe anymore, said, oh, it is true. He said, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> that, to me, is an experience. That is what an experience is about. And I think someone mentioned earlier, I think it may have been Dean, that sales now is about 
service. Service is about sales. It's about giving our guest a real experience. For me, it's the best experience my daughter's ever experienced. And for my son to now become a believer, he's now asking about Santa again, but we're getting through that. But the point is, that is a world-class experience. And that's what it's about. And let me give you another example of just this. Last week, I mentioned I was in France. I was in the southwest France, a place called uh, Vigier. And on the top right corner was the hotel I stayed at. It's called the Chateau de Vigier. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, and when I got there, it was owned by these two, the loveliest men in the world, husband and husband, and they were absolutely charming. And they, they introduced me, they, they told me their story, that they bought this chateau two years ago for their dream. They both moved from England to live in France. And they just started telling me their story, and it was real passion. And they said, do you mind if we show you around? We'd love to show you it. I said, of course. And they showed me around the whole chateau. Then I went into my private room. And it was a small room, and, they, and I was the only guest of the, staying there. And they said, we're going to make you a home-cooked meal. Is, is there anything you don't eat? I said, no, no, I'm really good. I'm, I'm not fussy. And they brought me the most beautiful three-course food. They gave me a glass of red wine that they grew on their vineyard. It was incredible. And in the morning, I went for breakfast with them, actually, in the in big sort of family room. And they, and they had 15 homemade jams that they made, this brioche that was melt in your mouth. It was incredible. And one of them, Andy, who was one of the guys who owned the place, said, I ask one thing of you. I said, of course, what is it? He said, it's important. We, we, we like memories and we like to keep every picture of our guests. Would you mind if I take your photo? I said, of course. So on, you can see there on the bottom picture is every guest that's ever stayed with them. Then on the left is my picture they took, and I signed it as they asked. And then the other, his partner John, said, would you mind? And he gave me a hammer. So I'm thinking, has he heard about my talk inside the mind of a serial killer? And he gave me a little pin. He said, could you pin that into our log? We like to keep a memento of every guest that stays with us. I loved it. To me, that was personalization at its best. It costs him nothing. But I'm going to tell people about that for many, many years. And I've stayed around the world I'm in some amazing places. But that was the experience that I'm going to remember. And the truth is, that's what it's about. It's about the little things that make the big, big difference. And this is what the top 1% do. They make they show emotion, they, sh they create an experience for the guests to talk about forever, like the Tooth Fairy in Forte Village, like Chateau de Vigier, where I just put a pin in a log, but it sticks with me and will stick with me for good because it's a different experience. And I work with this guy called Nick, this tattoo artist, and Nick runs a really cool tattoo studio in Camden. And he said to me, Tony, I know you talk about experiences and giving the best service, but ultimately, I'm just a tattoo artist. How can I do it better? And I said to Nick, why did you start the job in the first place? And he said to me, because I want to create memories for people. I want to create dreams for people that they can put on their body. And I said, OK, so how could you turn it into an experience? And we sat there over a few bottles of wine one evening. And I said to him that I want to get a tattoo. He said, tell me about it. And I, unfortunately, I lost my dad 12 years ago. And, and in my, when he was 54, bless him. And in my dad's last year, because he knew his sort of time was up, he, he bought a boat. Yeah, it was one of his sort of bucket lists. And he bought this small little sailing boat. And he wants to name it after me and my sister Lucy. And he said to me, can you think of a name that would encapsulate you and Lucy. And I came up with Looney. That was the name. And he had Looney on the boat. So I said to Nick, the tattoo I want is a boat. And I said, but I want something about my children as well. And my kids are called Harry and Poppy. And Happy was born. So he's currently designing for me a small boat with Happy beneath it, with the date of my dad when my dad was born. But then came the experience. And he only gave it to me last week, and I, I, I haven't got pictures, apologies, to show you. But he gave me a book, a really beautiful book. And in the first picture of the book was a picture of my dad. The second picture was my dad's boat. The third picture was my children. 
The fourth picture was his original sketches of the design that he's doing for me, because he's not finished the design yet. And now he's giving his clients memories of life. He doesn't just do tattoos anymore. He gives them a memory book to keep forever. And, and I love that because, and yes, he's charging 25 pounds more for the book, but good on him because that's the experience I'm going to take away forever and it's a memory that will be held close to my heart. Now, don't get me wrong, sometimes we get tattoos when we're drunk and it means nothing. There'll be no book. But sometimes it'll be a memory you keep on you for the rest of your life. And that, to me, is what this is about. It's about the experience. It's about the personalization. And it's about getting people to remember you forever, the experience you leave them with. I want to end on this. Your day yesterday and your morning has been a total waste of time <laughs> if you do nothing differently. There's a very well-known saying, knowledge is power. I don't believe it. You could be so knowledgeable. If you don't use it, it's not that powerful. So for me, to give you absolute value for the rest of your day, I want to talk about changing habits. Because what I have noticed with these top 1% is they do have a couple of bad habits, they've, but they've got more good habits. So in order to make you the best of the best, which you are, and I want to, you would just stay there, I want to be able to help you giving you the best habits that you can leave with. And, and I work with a, a, a psychologist called James Clear who works on habit formation. And James has said to me, it takes between 21 and 28 days to break your bad habits and build new ones. And James explained to me there's three proven ways to change your habits. Does anyone know one of them? How do we change our habits? Anyone? I'll help you. Repetition. Once you know the new habit, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until it gets fixed. Anyone know the second way to change a habit? Well, if you didn't know the first, you probably won't know the second. <laughs> it's called visual reminders. Whatever the habit you want to create, have a picture of it. Have a picture of it close to you. It makes it easier to form. But the third is the most powerful. The third habit formation is called linking. Let me explain. In my job, I travel lovely places. And a lot of the hotels I stay at don't have a gym. And I don't like excuses. I don't believe in excuses. So rather than say there's no gym there, I do a workout called Insanity. Has anyone, show of hands, anyone heard of Insanity? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. So if you haven't, it's a nine-week workout. It's incredible by a guy called Sean T who's just got a body to die for. And it's uh, seven days a week for nine weeks. And I remember I, I finished it about eight months ago. I absolutely loved it, got the T-shirt, and then I did my back in. And I, I've been seeing a physio called Lisa now for about six months. And I said to Lisa, I love Insanity, but it's really damaged my back. And she said she also loves Insanity because it's doubled her business. <laughs> and she said to me, you don't, need an, you don't need an operation, but you're going to need an injection. She said, you've damaged what's called your lumbar spine, your lower back. You, because of the high intensity, you've really caused serious damage, and you're going to need a cortisone injection. If you've not heard of that, it's a needle about that big that goes in the base of your spine. And I'm a wuss. I'm scared of little needles, so that horrifies me. And I said to her, is there anything I can do to avoid the needle? She said, you need hip mobility. I said, what the hell is that? She said, Tony, imagine your hip was a bucket of water full to the top. She said, eight times a day, you've got to tilt the bucket both sides to have hip mobility. And I said to her, how the hell am I going to remember to do that every day? She said, do you drink much tea or coffee? I said, yeah, loads. I love it. She said, next time you grab a tea or a coffee, do it. I kid you not, at 7.30 this morning, I ordered a latte, and as the guy served it to me, I was like this. <laughs> he said, what the bloody hell do you think you're doing? I said, I'm building a habit, step away. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, understand your customer because they want to be sold to how they want to be sold to. Show an interest in them because people like to talk about themselves. Understand what their problem, their challenge, whatever it might be, but create an experience they'll remember forever and personalize it in any way you can. 
in this world, it's not about meeting expectations. It's actually not about exceeding expectations. It's about creating a magical experience. How can you go and create that magical experience for your guest? And something they'll talk about for the next 40, 50, or 60 years. I wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Please give it up for Tony. That was absolutely brilliant. A really good refresh. Thank you. Okay. Tony will be joining us after the coffee break. We've now got 15 minutes coffee break and coffee's just outside. Uh, get some fresh air if you can as well and be back in at 20 past if possible, please. Thank you.